Hello, welcome to the next in our series of videos on demystifying IFRS night impairment requirements. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our Global Accounting Technical Group for Financial Instruments and I'm here today with Mark Randall. Mark's in our UK banking practice, very much helping our UK banks as they apply IFRS 9. Today we're going to talk about IFRS 9's requirement to include forward-looking information and particularly its requirement to consider multiple forward-looking economic scenarios. Now those of you who have been following our series may remember that we've already talked about this subject, number four in our series. In that video we covered the basic IFRS 9 requirements for forward-looking information, why you might need to have multiple forward-looking economic scenarios, in particular where your book has non-linearities within it, and how you determine how many scenarios you need to have. I think as banks have got in, into implementing this area of the standard, a second question has arisen. Once you've determined how many scenarios you've got, so let's suppose you've done your analysis and decided it's three scenarios or five or seven, how do you then weight those scenarios? How much weight do you give to each of those? And that's what we're going to cover today. So Mark, can I hand over to you to talk us through an example? Sure, Sandra. So if we begin with a very simple example that assumes perfect knowledge, just to try to illustrate the point here, um, let's assume that a bank is, is able to look at all the, all the possible scenarios and range them in order of severity from the north percentile up to the 100th percentile. If we then look at a diagram representing what the loss profile might look like over those um, scenarios, What's really important in determining the weightings is, is looking at what happens in the, for example, three scenarios you've chosen and then understanding what cluster of scenarios is that most representative for. So if we look at the diagram and in this illustrative example, it's been determined that a downside scenario in the 10th percentile is going to capture those material nonlinearities. If in that downside scenario, the loss that arises is 95, the key question for the weighting is then, well, what range of scenarios is that loss of 95 the most representative for? And in the example we've got on the screen, if because of the relatively flat loss profile in the region between the north and the 30th percentile, that loss in the downside scenario of 95 is actually the most representative for all those, those scenarios between the north and the 30th percentile, then you might well expect that a weighting of 30% is given to that downside scenario. That contrasts with an alternate approach you might take if you didn't have regard to what the loss profile looked like, which might be simply to say, well, in determining my downside scenario, I've gone to the 10th percentile, so I'll just give that a 10% weighting. In the scenario on the, on the screen, what that might result in is a material understatement of the losses. In particular, if the losses that arise in the base case scenario are significantly lower than you get in that downside scenario. So as I said, that's a illustration using per, assuming perfect knowledge. That's not the real world. So Sandra, do you want to pick up some of the more practical considerations? Thanks, Mark. You make a very good point. Of course, in the real world, you don't have perfect data. And IFRS 9 itself says that you only use information that's reasonable and supportable. However, I think it's very important to bear in mind that banks are expected to use information that is available to them. That might come from a variety of sources, for example, from stress tests, from analysis of historically how book has performed under different economic scenarios, or from peer data. However, inevitably, this is going to be an area of significant judgment, and there will be the need for expert credit judgment to be used. And that itself is fully in line with IFRS 9. So Mark, having explained this is probably more of an art than a science, is there anything else banks should be thinking about? Yeah, there's a couple of areas I would flag. The first is around consistency. Now I think naturally the scenarios that banks need to select to capture their nonlinearities and also the weightings they apply will naturally evolve over time to take account of changes. But what's important, I think, is that there's an overarching consistent approach to that that's applied consistently from period to period. And for that reason, whilst the natural emphasis might be very much around what are the weightings that transition, thinking ahead as to how is this going to play out in the future, what might, what will cause my weightings to change, what might not cause them to change, will be an important factor. 
governance is also going to be important given the judgment exercise and secondly because of that judgment and the impact that, that different judgments might have the disclosures around the multiple scenarios is going to be really important to help users understand what impact has arisen from them uh, and that's not going to be just the IFRS 7 disclosure requirements uh, for financial instruments but the more general disclosure requirements applicable to all areas around critical judgments and estimates in IS1 they also need to be thought about and I think that there might be a natural emphasis just to really focus on the numbers and forget about those other aspects they're equally important if not as important. Thanks Mark some really good thoughts there. So just to recap as I'm sure you're well aware forward-looking information is a big area of judgment and a big area of change in IFRS 9 and we've talked today particularly about how to weight different scenarios as Marx explained, simply for example picking the 10th percentile and giving it a 10% weighting is probably not going to be appropriate. You need to think about what range of outcomes that 10th percentile is representing. We've noted this is more of an art than a science. There will be a need for expert credit judgment and really looking at what data you have and how you can best use it. We've also noted the need for a consistent approach and for good disclosures. And thank you very much for listening. I hope you'll join us next time. Bye-bye.